journey to lost civilizations. See ancient artifacts and long lost ancient scrolls. The strange writing on this clay brick is known as cuneiform. Now the script was used Take the journey of a lifetime and travel to ancient Babylon and the island of Patmos to discover how ancient mysteries reveal the future. A live seminar series. Don't miss any program. Let's try again. How are you? We're glad you've joined us again this evening. Uh, tonight we have an amazing program together. You're just going to be amazed to see how accurate the Bible's prophecies are. As we go into Countdown Eternity, Ancient Mystery Revealed. You know, people are actually telling us today that Nostradamus, the French psychic and astrologer, predicted the arrival of the coronavirus. Well, who was Nostradamus? Well, he lived back in the 1500s. This gentleman was a French astrologer and a physician. And uh, he had written about 1,000 quatrains. We call these quatrains, they're four-line rhymes. And he wrote about 1,000 of them. And people say these quatrains are predictions that he made about the future. Let's have a look at his methods that he used when he was making his predictions. He would sit alone in a dark room and then he would gaze at water in a bowl that was hanging in the air over a, from a, a pole. He would then touch the water with his wand and then he would dampen his robe and stare at the water surface there. And then he would hear voices, so they say. And as a result of these things, he would hear about predictions in the future. His 1,000 quatrains that he wrote, one of them said, supposed to have predicted the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Another one, the Great Fire of London in 1666. And then, of course, the summer storms of 1996. And so one of the other quatrains so they say the experts was the prediction of the coronavirus. Here's the quatrain. Let's notice it here. Near the gates and within two cities, there will be two scourges, the like of which was never seen. Famine within plague, people put up out by steel, crying to the great immortal God for relief. Now, I'm not sure how you get the coronavirus out of that, but that's what the experts say. Well, Time magazine, back in 1999, wrote an article that the Nostradamus experts said he predicted that the world would end this month. That was, here's the quatrain, the year 1999, seven months from the sky, there will come a great king of terror. That was the prediction that was supposed to happen, the end of the world. Well, we're still here. So Nostradamus didn't get it right. In fact, the Bible actually says that if a person says he's making predictions and they don't actually come to pass, you'll know that person's actually not speaking for God. In fact, you know, many people make predictions, but the Bible tells us that predictions must always come out exactly right. That's why we've seen in this series that this book has a batting average of 100%. Because anyone speaking for God, their predictions actually come to pass. Now, this evening, I want to talk about the spectacular prophecy that Nostradamus missed. He sure didn't get this one. And it's an amazing prophecy that was written 2,500 years ago. First of all, before we go back to that prophecy, we go back 2,000 years. John is on the island of Patmos. He's writing the book of Revelation. And as he's hearing and seeing these great visions, he notices Earth's final events. We've seen this passage before, but I want you to notice it again tonight. The nations were angry, he says, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, 
and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. Now you will recall that the ark of the covenant is only seen or was only seen on one day of each year. We noticed that in our last program. Just one day of the year was the Ark of the Covenant was seen. And that was on what we noticed was called the cleansing of the sanctuary or the Day of Atonement, which was an annual day of judgment for the Jewish people, you will recall. This cleansing of the sanctuary or the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur, this portrayed Earth's final judgment day down toward the end of time. Now let's come back to the prophet Daniel. This is 500 years now before the book of Revelation was written. We notice that the prophet Daniel wrote about an amazing prophecy where he saw a ram and a goat fighting each other. You'll remember that prophecy. We noticed it. But you'll remember this phrase when he saw that little horn coming out of one of the four points of the compass, doing terrible things, trampling on God's people, casting truth to the ground, standing up against the prince of princes and so on. You remember the question was asked, how long is this going to go on for? Until when? Here was the answer we noticed. For 2,300 days, then the sanctuary will be cleansed. Or as we saw last program, that means the judgment will begin. So here's the question, the answer to the question. For 2,300 days, then the sanctuary will be cleansed or the judgment will begin. So how do we understand this 2,300 day thing now? How do we understand that part? We understood about the sanctuary. We understood about the cleansing of the sanctuary. Now we need to understand the 2,300 days. Well, notice what Daniel has said. After 2,300 days, then the judgment will begin. At that point, the angel Gabriel appears before Daniel. And I want you to notice what Gabriel says to Daniel. He says, the vision of the evenings and the mornings, that's the 2,300 days, because the evening and the morning is a day. The vision of the evenings and the mornings, which was told, it's true. Therefore, seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. So this is going to take you down a long time, says the angel Gabriel. I understand, son of man, that the vision, that's of the 2,300 days, it refers to the time of the end. That's what he tells him. This vision of the 2,300 evenings and mornings will actually take us to the time of the end, many days into the future. This is obviously greater than 2,300 literal days because that's a long that's a very short period, I should say. That's only about six and a half years from Daniel's time. But this takes us to the time of the end. So this is clearly longer than 2,300 literal days. In actual fact, the 2,300 prophetic days of Daniel 8 are symbolic of 2,300 literal years. We've seen that principle many times before. One prophetic day, one literal year. Remember the prophet Ezekiel, a contemporary of Daniel, I have laid on you each day for a year. So one day, one year. So that means the 2,300 days when the sanctuary will cleansed or the judgment will begin is 2,300 literal years. Now, you can imagine, Daniel, why so long before God acts? Have you ever asked those questions? Maybe you're asking those questions right now in the middle of the coronavirus. You've just lost your job. I hope that's not the case, but many people are. And we have those questions. Why, God? And when are you going to... St I need this and I need that. Daniel was wondering the same question. Why so long before God acts? How come God is letting this thing go on? Notice the answer, or notice Daniel's reaction, I should say. I, Daniel, fainted, and I was sick for days. I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. You will notice this chapter ends with Daniel very anxious. He's fainted. He's sick. He can't understand. Why so long before God acts? That's where the vision ends. 
without understanding. Well, the next chapter, chapter 9, we've noticed before, but Daniel is praying because the 70 years of captivity where the Jews would be 70 years in Babylon are just about finished. And Daniel knows God made a prophecy through Jeremiah that they would be there 70 years. So now he's praying for God to deliver them. Let's notice what happens as Daniel's praying, confessing his sin and the sin of his people and asking God to deliver them. Suddenly, Gabriel appears again, the same Gabriel who appeared in the previous chapter. Notice what Gabriel says. Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. In other words, you didn't understand in the last chapter. Now I've come to help you understand what you didn't understand. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. That is the vision of the 2,300 evenings and mornings that you didn't understand. Now I've come to help you understand some more. Notice what he says, and we've seen this before, but we're going to go further in this program. Seventy weeks are determined. That means in the Hebrew, they're cut off. They're chopped off from something. They're severed for your people and for your holy city. Now, cut off from what? Chopped off from what? Or severed from what? What does he mean? Well, you recall there were 2,300 days or years and then the judgment or the sanctuary would be cleansed. So he says this 70-week period is cut off. It's cut off from this period of time. That's what he's telling him. Daniel, I come to help you understand about this. Now, you need to understand that there's a 70-week period or 490 years we've seen before, 70 weeks times seven days, 490 days and a day for a year. This is cut off. Now, cut off for who? Well, you notice what Gabriel says. 70 weeks are determined, cut off or chopped off from this period, the 2,000 for your people and for your holy city. Now, of course, this is the Jews and Jerusalem, Daniel's people and his city. There's a 490-year period taken off from the 2,300 years that applies to the Jewish people, he's telling him. Your people, Daniel, your city. Now, when's the starting date for this prophecy? The 490 years and therefore the same as the 2,300 because this is cut off from that longer period. When's the starting date? We've seen it before, but Gabriel says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem. Jerusalem's in ruins. When the command is given to restore it, that's the starting date, Daniel says Gabriel. When was that command given? We've seen it before from the book of Ezra. Thank God that he has these things recorded in his book. The Bible interprets itself, you see. So when we go to Ezra, the book of Ezra, which deals with the Jews coming out of Babylon, he says, in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes, a Persian king, I issue a decree, says King Artaxerxes. And we know when the seventh year of Artaxerxes was. It's the year 457 BC. We've seen it before. So let's come back to our diagram now. Here's our starting date for the 70 weeks and also for the 2,300 because this is cut off from the longer period. So 457 we just now need to add 2,300 days, years, because a day for a year. Let's do that. 457 plus 2,300. And remember, as we go, BC, then go to AD, we have to start. That's why we take it off. We take 457 from 2,300. We're getting closer and closer to what would be... We would think a zero year, but there is no zero year. And then we go AD time. So 457, 2300 will bring us to the year 1844. 1844. So this is when the judgment begins, according to Daniel, according to Gabriel. After 2300 years, then the sanctuary will be cleansed. And we saw that means the judgment will begin. So that's when it begins. Now, you, I can almost hear you asking right now, how can you be sure about that? Are you certain? How can we know that the judgment of God begins in 1844 or began at that point in time? 
It's because of the first part, the 70 weeks or 490 years. You recall, we've taken two programs on this now. Remember, the 70 weeks are precise because they predict 500 years before Jesus, he would be baptized in 27 AD. And Jesus was. History records it. Luke records it. It predicted that Christ would be crucified or die in 31 AD, and he was, exactly on time. And then the 490 years would run out in the year 34 AD. What happened in 34 AD? Well, two things happened. Stephen was stoned. Remember that man stoned by the Jews? And then, of course, a great persecution broke out. And the Jewish, the Jewish Christians took the gospel to the non-Jewish people. Paul was converted around this time and he became the apostle to the non-Jewish people. So the 490 years finished in 34 AD exactly on time. That part is precise. So you see, if that's precise, and it was, Jesus was baptized in 27 AD, he was crucified in 31 AD, if that's right, that has to be right because it's the, part of the same prophecy. You see, the prophetic timing of Christ his life and his death assures us that the end point, 1844, when the judgment begins, is absolutely rock solid. Because if that's not right, then Jesus didn't die on time. He wasn't baptized on time, but he was. So this is absolutely correct. Judgment, you see, began in 1844. In fact, John, in the book of Revelation, makes it very plain that judgment begins before Jesus returns the second time. Because when we go to the book of Revelation, we notice God's final messages, three of them. We're starting to see them. The first angel's message, at its heart, it says what? We're looking at it tonight. The hour of God's judgment has begun. In the Greek language, when it says God's judgment has come, it means when the angel announces that, it has already started. That's the force of the Greek tense. So the judgment has begun already, is the first angel. Then John sees another angel come after the first one in time. The second one tells us Babylon has fallen. We're going to understand what that means when we come to the program Night Cry, Demonic Dimensions. Don't miss that program. An amazing prophecy there so the second angel says Babylon has fallen then comes a third angel after the second which comes after the first in time and the third angel says don't receive the mark of the beast of course you mustn't miss the program coming up 666 and the mark of the beast vital program for the days in which we're living so you will notice three angels first angel judgment has begun then comes a second after the, that. And finally, later down, the third angel says, don't receive the mark of the beast. And then John sees Jesus coming after that. The Bible says, then I looked and behold a white cloud. And on the clouds that one like the son of man, having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. You notice here comes a picture of Jesus reaping the harvest. But you'll notice what's happened. Judgment has already begun before Jesus returns, just like Daniel has said. Only Daniel tells us when it began in his time. Judgment, my friend, tonight is on right now while you and I are sitting here in your lounge room, and I'm sharing this message. The judgment has already begun. That's a very solemn thought. This is a unique time in earth's history, in other words. We are in the countdown to eternity. This is not playtime. This is not time as normal. In fact, the very hour in which we're living, which, what's transpiring around our world tonight, reminds us of the prophecies of the Bible. And one of the prophecies reminds us that we're living in the time of the judgment. Jesus is about to return. Soon he will come as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We don't know when he will come, but he will come when the judgment finishes. But right now it's on and nobody knows when the judgment will finish. We just are told it's begun at this time. You see now why there's a global urgency in the book of Revelation. 
very much a global urgency in this book. For example, notice what the first angel says. Then I saw another angel flying. You see angels in the book of Revelation. But it never they don't use that word so much what flying. John uses this word because it means he's in a hurry. There's no time to lose. Why is there no time to lose? By the way, he's in the midst of heaven. He's prominent. Everybody needs to understand this in other words. Having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, saying with a loud voice. This is a great megaphone voice, a loud message. What's that message? The hour of God's judgment has come. My friend tonight, with all the urgency that I can muster, I want to say this is a unique time in earth's history. This is no time for us to be playing around and trying to sit on fences. This is a time to make commitments to God because this is not a normal time in the history of the earth. And the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation are screaming that to the world. This is no ordinary time. We must prepare for the soon return of Jesus Christ. In fact, you know, when Jesus Christ was here and he gave the signs of the end of the world from the Mount of Olives, right up here we saw, you will notice that he talked about the end of the world and those signs. And I want you to notice he gave two in interesting illustrations. First of all, he said that as it was in the days of Noah, so it would be in our day in the end of time, just before his return. You know, it amazes me that archaeologists have discovered great evidence for the flood. For example, we have Babylonian cuneiform tablets of the flood story that almost reads the same as the Bible. We have the Gilgamesh epic and we have the Atrahasis epic, they're just two. And there are many flood stories all around the world, but not just flood stories. We find, for example, that up on Mount Everest, there are fossilized shells on this mountain. Something happened in this world Many years ago, there was a flood, and Jesus believed it, and Jesus taught it. But notice what he said. As in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking. They were marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be? Do you see what Jesus is saying? He's saying as we near the end of time, people will be going about life, business as usual, as in the days of Noah. They left it too late. They put the decisions off and the flood came and caught them unawares. So it will be, my friend. Jesus is telling us these things because he loves us. He wants to make, help us to be ready for the soon return, his soon return. They were unprepared and the flood swept them away. But Jesus also gave another illustration of what it would be like toward the end of the world. He gave an illustration from the great city of Sodom and Gomorrah. In fact, you know, archaeologists recently, some of them believe we've discovered Sodom at a place called Tel El Hammam in Jordan. This is today. And you can visit this site. We were here just last year. And when you visit this site, you will notice that there was some rather amazing destruction that took place. For example, you see here a huge layer of ash. Now, ash for an archaeologist means this is an, a layer of destruction. Someone, something destroyed this with fire. They even found that humongous temperatures overtook this place much like you see with the at atomic bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, incredible heat. They've discovered evidence for this in this place. Well, we can't be dogmatic, but Jesus believed in Sodom and Gomorrah. Notice what he said. Likewise, also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. And then he adds these words, remember Lot's wife. You see, because God told 
Lot and his wife and their daughters as they were escaping. By the way, you know, it's amazing, the story of Sodom, the incredible grace of God. Two angels were sent to Sodom itself to bring Lot and his family out. But they were so in love with Sodom and its, its stuff there and its material things that they just hung around and didn't move. Finally, the angel said, to them, listen, this place is going to be destroyed. And they grabbed hold of Lot's hand and his wife's hand and their daughter's hand, and they almost dragged them out of the city because they knew what was coming, these angels. And they said, don't look back. Don't look back. But sadly, Lot's wife, because her heart was back in Sodom, she turned back, and the Bible says, instantly she died, turned into a pillar of salt, according to to the book of Genesis. What a tragic, tragic story. But that's what Jesus is reminding us. Don't get so fixated with the things of this world. Don't get so preoccupied with all of this stuff that we forget the eternal realities and the day in which we're living. Make sure we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You know, my friend, we're seeing one of the great signs in the Bible right before our eyes today. Jesus said there will be pestilences, super germs, and we're seeing it. We're in the midst of one. He gave those signs because he wants you and I to be ready for his soon return. Remember Lot's wife. Sadly, the people of Sodom were unprepared. They kept going business as usual, and then tragedy overtook them. And that's why when we come to the book of Revelation, where God spells out very clearly that the hour of God's judgment has come. That's why in this book you see angels everywhere. They're in a hurry. For example, you have seven angels blowing seven trumpets to warn the world the day of judgment is coming, warning human beings. You not only see seven angels, you see these three angels with earth's last messages flying across the midnight heavens. God is urgent loves his children so he sends these messages not only that in revelation you see four angels pushing back the winds of strife from beating up this planet from overtaking with destruction god sends angels hold back because i love my people i don't want anybody to miss out so god sends angels they're all through the book of revelation my friend and why is that peter tells us why notice what peter says the lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness, but is long-suffering to us would. You know, God is so long-suffering to us. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. You see, John was shown the coming of the day of the Lord, but God showed him how angels would be flying everywhere, doing everything they could for humanity. Why was God doing this? Why does God reveal? Because he's long-suffering. God's love is so long. I have a friend, passed away now, but he was a Christian up until about 17 years of age. And then he left God, turned his back on the things of the Bible, turned his back on God and did his own thing. And that went on for nearly 70 years. Lived a life that was just for himself lived a life of fun and sport and pleasure and materialism, no thought for God. And as he got to the years of about 70 years of age, thank God his spirit began to wrestle with this man, this friend of mine. He began to plead with him, it's time you came back, your life is nearly over. Come back before it's forever too late. And I remember talking with that friend of mine quite some length, trying to help him to turn back to God. He, 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 he wanted to, but he felt some of the stuff he'd done was just too bad. God would never forgive him. And he wrestled with that for about seven years, thinking that God would never forgive him. And God still pleaded with him. And finally, I remember, he just sunk into the arms of God and said, Oh, God, I've lived my life without you, but now I want to come home. I want to come back. And he turned his life over to God. He asked me to baptize him. But the week before the baptism, during that week, he passed away.
But I know he's ready to meet God because he gave his life for him. Baptism's just an outward sign that he'd given his life to God. But I'll see him one day in that forever land because he'd given his life back to God. What a long-suffering God. What was God going to get out of this? And a man who'd lived his life for himself and at the end God calls him back. What a tremendous, graceful, filled God we have. God loves the world so much, no matter how far we've wandered, no matter how many years we've been from him, he still loves us and wants us to come back. And there's good news in the judgment that we've talked about. I know it's a solemn message, a very solemn message, especially when we consider that the judgment actually has already started. But there's mighty good news in this message tonight, my friend. You remember in Daniel 7 last week we saw that little horn doing terrible things. That was the Antichrist, we noticed, trampling on God's people, changing God's laws against Christ and so on. Notice what Daniel saw as he was watching. I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints and was prevailing against them, beating God's people, until... Until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. This judgment that starts is in exactly the same place in the next chapter, chapter 8, that we're looking at tonight, when it says, unto 2,300 days, then the sanctuary will be cleansed. Exactly the same place, because the sanctuary cleansing is the judgment. And that's what Daniel saw. Judgment was now made in favor of the saints of the Most High. The saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. In other words, they take part in that last empire that with no death, no pain, no tears, no sorrow. That's arrived now. Question tonight, as we draw to a close here, is this. Why was the judgment in favor of God's people? How come they received a favorable judgment in the great judgment that's taking place right now in heaven? That's where it's taking place. Here's how come, my friend. I beheld till the thrones were cast down. The ancient of days did sit. The judgment was set and the books were opened. This is it. Because you remember, John saw the temple of God opened where? In heaven. In other words, there's a heavenly temple. Not that the heaven is the temple, but he saw the temple of God opened in heaven. In other words, the great judgment day. That's where he saw the Ark of the Covenant. Ten Commandments on the judgment day. God's judgment takes place. But he's seeing it now. I beheld till the thrones were cast down. The Ancient of Days sat. The judgment was set. And the books were open. I saw in the night visions. Now notice the good news here. And behold, one like the Son of Man. In other words, this is Jesus we saw last week. One like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days and they brought him near before him. So here comes Jesus in that great judgment scene. He now comes in and he's taken to the Father. What happens? There was given him dominion. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Good news, my friend. Jesus goes into that judgment on our behalf. He goes in, he takes the kingdom, and then he shares it with us. He goes in and takes the kingdom and then gives it to us. We share it with him. What marvelous good news tonight. Thank God that Jesus is alive, that he goes into that judgment for us. You see, in that judgment, Christ stands up for you and I. He speaks on our behalf. He's our representative. All who have accepted his death, all who have put their trust in Jesus, all who have said, nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to that old rugged cross I cling. People like my friend who say, God, here I am just as I am. These are the ones he stands up for in that judgment. He speaks on our behalf. Now, how can you be confident with a judgment that's going on right now? How can you have confidence at such a time as this? Here's how, my friend. Because of the first part. Remember, this part was cut off from the 2,300 days or years. This part is why you and I can have absolute confidence at such a time as this. Because, remember, 
in a previous program, we saw the purpose of that first part, those 490 years that was cut off. We noticed the first part. The purpose was, one, to end our rebellion against God. And my friend, the heart of this prophecy was Christ and him crucified. You see, when we see that Jesus died in our place, when you see that Jesus took your sin and died your death and my death, our rebel hearts are broken. You see, nothing moves a human being to know that God so loved the world that his only son died in our place. Marvelous grace. That's why Paul says, God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through whom the world is crucified to me and I to the world. The cross of Calvary breaks our rebel hearts. It gives victory over sin and wrong. There's a power in the blood of Jesus. In other words, power when I accept his death into my life, I have a new power in my life. In other words, a drug addict gives up his drugs. An impure person becomes pure. A, a, a violent person becomes gentle. The power of Jesus to change us from the inside out is incredible. The other purpose was to reconcile us to God, to bring us back to God because sin has separated us from God. But in Christ crucified, when I believe in him, I am the child of God. I am brought near to the Father. Remember, we also saw to forgive and to justify us, to, to count us as if we never sinned in the first place because Christ's righteousness is credited to our account. And finally, to put God's laws in our hearts, in our lives, so that we want to do the right thing, so that we want to live a good life, so that we have power to live a good life. That's the purpose of the 490 years. And in other words, all of that is absolutely true. This is why this part is part of the great prophecy dealing with the judgment, because it's because of this first part, which speaks of Jesus coming, that we make it through the judgment of God. These, this part, the 70 weeks, Jesus was baptized on time. Jesus was crucified on time. This assures us that all of that is true. You see, the prophetic timing of Christ's life and death assures you and I of a safe passage through that great judgment that is now taking place. My friend, imagine if your name comes up in the judgment tonight, because that could happen. Now, I know people don't like to hear that sort of talk, but if the judgment is going on, it could happen. How would you stand? Let me tell you how you can stand. And that is if you say, oh, Lord, I claim Christ. There is nothing to fear if your name comes up in judgment, if you have Christ, because Christ stands for you. Christ stands for me. There's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Remember, we saw Jesus is not only our judge and our lawyer. <laughs> That's almost enough. If the judge is your lawyer, you can't lose the case. But we saw something else. Jesus took our judgment. Unbelievable when you think about it. That the one who, who judges us, he actually took our very judgment when he went to the cross. Amazing grace, you see. Unbelievable grace is the grace of God toward every human. There is no reason why any person should be lost with a God like that. The only reason anybody should be lost is because they choose to cling to sin and will not turn to the Savior. My friend, tonight, give your life to Christ. Ask him to come into your life and you will be the happiest person who ever lived because Christ changes us and makes us safe passed with because he stands for us in the judgment i love the words of the apostle paul and he ought to know because paul was a terrible man paul was killing christians hunting them like dogs putting them in prison he hated christ and jesus would not give up on him and jesus met him on the road to damascus one day when he was on his way to kill christians and jesus changed his life and he can do the same for you and I tonight. In this solemn day of judgment hour in which we're living, there's no condemnation. In this final message, a most solemn message with a global urgency, 
Let's notice it again. The hour of his judgment has come. As we saw earlier, this is not playtime. This is not time as usual time. We are living in the day of the judgment hour when God's judgment is heaven is taking place. But in that solemn hour, notice the good news message. Right at the heart of this angel's message, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven. What does he carry? What does he have? What is the solution for earth's judgment time? What is the way through? Notice it. Having the everlasting gospel. The good news that this man receives sinners, that God accepts us as we are. Notice who he takes this good news to. He preaches it to every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every person. My friend, tonight you matter to God. In this judgment hour time, you matter to God. He loves you with an undying love. That's why you are listening to this message tonight. You wouldn't be here if God didn't love you. He said to you, I want you to hear this because I love you. That's why you're hearing it, because God has this message for every single person on the planet. And this Jesus, who became a human being for time and eternity and went to an old rugged cross, took your judgment and my judgment. Thank God for the old rugged cross that's the gospel that's the good news and tonight you need not remain a moment longer unsaved the moment a sinner comes to christ that moment they're pardoned won't you just as it were reach out to christ right now and say oh god i want christ accept me and right now you are forgiven you are accepted you are treated like the like the royal the child of God that you are. John, John said, God does, just doesn't call us sons and daughters. That's what we are, his children. Marvelous news tonight. You see, my friend, Jesus can see the day when God will wrap things up. Jesus gave so many signs that we're seeing fulfilled in our world today, signs that indicate his return. He's coming soon. And he wants you to be ready. He wants you to be part of his forever kingdom, his forever last empire. It happened here in Auschwitz. I've taken groups here to Auschwitz. It's a horrible place, a traumatic place. One million people perished in Auschwitz alone during the Second World War under the Nazi terrors. But here in Auschwitz, an incredible story unfolded. You see, the Nazis would often bring the prisoners, the Jewish prisoners and other prisoners out during the middle of the night in the middle of winter onto the parade ground just to cause them discomfort. And they would stand for hours sometimes in the middle of the night, freezing cold, snow on the ground. Well, one night they're called out on the parade ground, some of these prisoners, and the commandant says, Somebody did something wrong today and 10 men will die because of that infraction, that mistake that someone did. 10 of you are going to die. So he begins to methodically call out the numbers of prisoners. He begins to call out their numbers and prisoners step forward whose numbers are called out. He comes to the number of a man called Francis Kajanajic. When he calls out his number, there's a tremendous groan from Francis Kajanajik. He says, oh, no, her commandant, please, no, sir, not me. What about my wife? What about my children? How are they going to survive without me? Sir, please, not me. But he continues reading the numbers. After a few moments, there's a stir among the prisoners, and a prisoner steps forward and says, her commandant, I have a request. The man is a Roman Catholic priest, Maximilian Colby. And this Roman Catholic priest steps forward and says, Sir, I have a request. He says, Sir, I have no family. I have no children. I have no wife. But, Sir, I would like to ask, could I take the place of Francis Kajanajik with his, because he has children and a wife. Please, Sir, can I take his place? The commandant didn't know what to do. He'd never heard such a request from a prisoner. He, he, he just looked a bit embarrassed. He looked down. What? And finally, after a few moments, he said, 
request granted, and he continued to read the numbers of other men. Well, they took Maximilian Colby, the Catholic priest, with the nine others, and after about 30 days, Maximilian Colby died a horrific death in that concentration camp in Auschwitz. You can visit the cell of Maximilian Colby. We were there last year, and there in the cell, it's written, Jesus was here. Now, not the literal Jesus, what it's getting at. Just as Jesus gave his life for you and me, so this man gave his life for Francis Kajanajik. My friend tonight, that's how much you are loved. No matter how far you've wandered from God, no matter how long you've been wandering from God, he loves you so much that he took your judgment. That's why tonight you can lift up your head. You don't need to be afraid, though the judgment is going on now, because Jesus lives and he stands up for you in that judgment. I think we should thank God for the amazing prophecies of this book and for his amazing grace. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, what an incredible book the book of Revelation and Daniel are. Father, we would not want to share these sorts of things if it was left to us, but you do. You unfolded these 2,500 years ago to Daniel. You gave more information to John on the island of Patmos. You showed them both that the judgment begins before Jesus comes. And Lord, we're living in a solemn time. This is no time to play around. This is no time for business as usual. This is the time to put our lives in the hand of God. This is the time to say, God, you know my life, but I just want Christ. Father, tonight our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. If you'd like to say, Lord, Jesus, take my life. Come and accept me as I am. Jesus, live in me and stand for me in that judgment that's now going on. Just bow your head where you are and just tell the Lord that right now. Don't put it off, my friend. You may never be this close to the kingdom of God again as at the moment that God is speaking to you. Many people put it off and they put it off for eternity. Don't do that, my friend. Tonight, make your decision to say, Jesus, here's my life. Father, you hear our prayers to you tonight wherever we're sitting. Take our lives now. Thank you for this amazing book the Bible and its prophecies, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're glad you were able to be with us tonight. Unbelievable, the prophecies, aren't they? Boggles my mind. In fact, as I was sharing this message tonight, it just amazed me about the prophecies and the love of God for you and I, because we've all been rebels. But thank God he's a great God. Now, where are we heading? Tomorrow night, tomorrow night, Saturday night, 7 o'clock, Israel in the end times, new beginnings, a tremendously heartwarming program. We'll be going to the book of Revelation again as we begin the program. And it's amazing. I'm going to take you uh, on a quick ticky tour around some amazing places in the world tomorrow night. You'll be so glad you joined us. So invite a friend to watch it with you or tell them about the link and uh, they can join in this program, Israel in the end times. Then don't miss Sunday night's program. So that's tomorrow night, Saturday night. On Sunday night, America and the New World Order. Today, tomorrow, and you and me. This prophecy is unbelievable. Let me tell you, this prophecy that we're going to share on Sunday brings us right down to the very day in which we're living. You are going to see unbelievable things from the book of Revelation on Sunday night. You will just be amazed. You will say, how, how, how did God predict that? 2,000 years ago because you're going to see our day today. So don't miss that program on Sunday evening and we'll tell you about other programs that are coming. Make sure you go just under your screen where it says card and tick on that, that you would like to get a copy of the program, a resume, a summary of tonight's program. Make sure you click on that and we'd love to get that to you. If you have a question, why not write the question out on the card as well? There's a place to write a the question out send make sure you put your name address and your email there so we can get back to you and uh, we will get you the copy of the program 
And also we will seek to answer your question if you have a question. God bless you. Look after yourself and remember, God has promised, I will never, never leave you or forsake you. I am with you always, even to the end of the world.